words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Before there was any before there were rocks, before there were suns, before there were caterpillars, before there was anything, anything, there is God. God as a wondrous, ineffable, indescribable wonder of love being expressed between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before there was anything. Dionysius the Areopagite says that God's love is diffusive. So before anything, there is this wondrous, timeless movement of diffusive love within the very being of God. God is love. And then that diffusive love, always existing between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in a decision that's unfathomable to us, creates. And the universe springs into existence. Stars, planets, and a little solar system with the sun and tiny little planets circulating around the sun. One of them a little blueberry in the sky. And then God creates image bearers. Image bearers. Creatures made of brain, mind, soul, bone, flesh, Little creatures whom God calls image bearers who are indeed, as we've heard this morning, moral agents who are given the invitation to engage the love of God forever. The beginning of a story that was meant to be a song sung throughout the universe as these small little creatures enter into relationship with God. And then, to be quite blunt, I think it's true, to be quite blunt, all hell breaks loose. And in the, the garden that was meant to be their home, where all their needs were met, a voice appears, an evil voice, Oh, Eve, has God really said? Can you trust God? Look what God's done. He's keeping something from you. Honest. Trust yourself. Trust me. God cannot be trusted. And at that point, when Eve chooses to listen to a terribly bent voice, she herself becomes bent. Later, her husband, who seems gladly to follow this foreign bent voice, becomes bent. Now, the, there's a Latin phrase I'd like you to know. Uh, this was one that Augustine used, and it was one that uh, later Luther used. When those two listen to that bent, angelic voice, they themselves turn in on themselves. Here's the Latin phrase, incurvatus in se. Incurvatus in se, so past participle in Latin means they curved in on themselves away from the source of all life. They're bent. They go bad. And the result is all that was right 
becomes wrong. And in a manner of speaking, things begin to split apart that were always meant to be together. It is a great horror. It is a great, unfathomable horror. Now the question becomes this. How is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who have always experienced this great, wondrous bond of diffusive love between themselves, how are they going to respond to what's happened? Are they going to start the story again? Is it simply going to be punishment? Happily, we know that they choose to act through a little nation. And in that little nation, there finally comes one whom we know as Jesus. Now, I think that the next three minutes are kind of the heart of the matter when it comes to dealing with an immaterial God. So what happens? Another angel, a different angel, not a bent one, comes to a young woman living in a very specific place and says to her, you are favored. Would you offer your womb to God as the temple for the sun to come and inhabit? And what happens is, is this. So you have the Son, not the Father or the Spirit, but the Son who has always existed, always will exist, cannot stop existing, and cannot stop existing as God. The Son comes and takes Mary up on her offer of allowing her body to be used by God to start the story anew. And the Spirit of God comes upon her and cells begin to replicate in her body. These cells are utterly unique. Now, in your minds, I'm just imagining this happen. She senses a child growing within her, cells replicating that is going to be unlike any other child that has ever lived. Unlike, and yet like. And then, nine months later, a baby's born. And as you look at this baby, what you're seeing is God incarnate. The perfect union of divinity with the humanity offered to the Son, willingly, by the Virgin Mary. In an ineffable, indescribable union, God incarnate. The Son cannot stop being God. It's impossible. God can't stop being God. But in the person of the Son, the Father sends the Son, the Son joins himself to the uh, humanity offered to him by the Virgin Mary, and begins to grow into the one we worship as Jesus of Nazareth. Ephraim the Syrian, a uh, Syrian poet way back when, talks like this when he sees what's happening. He who knows all things begins to learn. He who has created all speech learns to speak himself. And so you have this little wonder growing up who takes our condition upon himself in the humanity he has assumed and begins to remake it. I just got let out of hoot almost. He begins to remake it, reform it, reshape it into what we were always meant to be. God incarnate. 
So God, the immaterial God, has entered our world very concretely in the person of the Son joining his nature to the human nature offered to him by the Virgin Mary. There has never been an image bearer like this one. Paul says he is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Did you hear it? By him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones, powers, rulers, or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things are hold together. Now the implications of this are staggering. We can look at God in the person of the Son, Jesus of Nazareth. Now the incarnate Son, Jesus of Nazareth. We can look at him and see what a real human being looks like. You want to know what a real human being looks like? There you have it. Not only so, we can look at how Jesus lived as an embodied self with a central nervous system like you and me, a mind like you and me. All these things were debated in the history of the church. He had a real human mind. So he grows in knowledge while knowing all things. He learns the very scripture he has inspired. You can't beat it. So, in a nutshell then, let's, take, let's close with this passage. This is Luke chapter 5, where Luke ties together this wonder of the incarnate Word who has become what we are so that we can become fully what He is. An invitation so Luke writes this in Luke chapter 5, verse 15. Luke describes how busy Jesus is. He's got a lot to do. So much to do. He's announcing the arrival of the kingdom, healing people, exercising people. So much to do. And then, like a little bombshell, in verse 16, of Luke chapter 5, Luke writes this, but he would often withdraw to lonely places and pray. So God, the incarnate Son, because he's genuinely human, is praying and providing us a fundamental pattern for living as his image bearers. I can hear Dallas saying, if he found it necessary to do such, how much more so we in our more troubled condition? Yeah. <laughs> but do you see the dynamic? An embodied self, plasticity of that embodied self in terms of the central nervous system. But we're not Greeks, we're Christians. Through the power of the Spirit, through the immense grace of God made known to us in the incarnation of the Son, we are invited to follow him as the pattern for what it means to be human. Through these concrete means of grace he gives us, with the result, with the result, love. Love. That's the mark. That's the mark of an image bearer, growing into the image of the great image bearer. So I, I, what I'm saying this morning, I think at the heart and core of the junction of the immaterial God with we as embodied material beings is the glory and wonder of the incarnation.